is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. This week in the Yonkazine Brief, we talk again about colorectal cancer. This is our second program of a three-part series about the disease, which is the third most common cancer diagnosed in the United States. Colorectal cancer is also the second leading cause of death from cancers that both affect men and women. According to the American Cancer Society, the overall lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer is about 1 in 22 for men and 1 in 24 for women. But in many cases, the disease is preventable. And prevention starts with awareness and accurate knowledge. This month is National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Doctors recommend screening for healthy people with no signs or symptoms in order to look for early evidence of colorectal cancer, which is also known as colon cancer. Finding colorectal cancer at its earliest stage makes it easier to treat. Overall, screening has been shown to reduce the risk of dying of colorectal cancer. People with an average risk of colorectal cancer should consider screening to begin at age 50. But if you have an increased risk, such as a family history of colorectal cancer, you should consider screening earlier. As we've discussed last week, and that is what you also will hear from our experts today, major medical societies are lowering the age to start screening from 50 years of age to 45 years of age. The primary reason is that over the last decades, doctors have seen an increase in colorectal cancer in younger people, while the incidence of cancer in older people, people over 50 years of age, is slowly declining. Several screening options exist, and each option has its own benefits and drawbacks. So, before deciding what you should do, talk to your doctor about your options. Together, you can decide which test is appropriate for you. Now, keep in mind, the gold standard in screening for colorectal cancer is colonoscopy. This procedure allows your doctor to screen and, when necessary, remove tissue samples or biopsies for analysis and remove polyps before they turn into cancer. Another screening option is Cologuard. This is a non-invasive screening option for adults 50 years of age and older at average risk. It is available on prescription only and in most cases covered by Medicare. And while there are no blood tests that can tell you if you have colorectal cancer or not, if you have been diagnosed with colorectal cancer, your doctor may use a blood test to understand prognosis and see if your cancer is responding to treatment or not. If you are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, your doctor will order specific tests to determine the extent or stage of your cancer. Stacing helps your doctor to find out what kind of treatment is the most appropriate for you. Following the diagnosis of cancer, there are a number of treatment options available, including surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and the treatment with specific targeted drugs. Targeted drugs are different than traditional chemotherapy, which is also used to treat colorectal cancer. Targeted therapy works by targeting the cancer's specific genes, proteins, or the tissue environment that contributes to cancer growth. In many cases, these targeted drugs can be given along with chemotherapy, but in most cases they are reserved for patients with advanced colorectal cancer. Now, keep in mind that not all people will benefit from targeted drugs. Some will benefit from treatment, while others do not. Some patients with advanced colorectal cancer may benefit from immunotherapies, such as pembrolizumab, also known under the brand name Keytruda, or nivolumab, which is also known as Opdivo. Again, these therapeutic agents are not helping all patients. A special companion diagnostic test will determine whether a patient's cancer will respond to these immunotherapies or not. As mentioned, radiation therapy can also be used in the treatment of colorectal cancer. One of the latest radiation therapies available is proton beam therapy, which can benefit children, young adults, and those with cancer located close to critical organs and body structures. In many cases, this very specific form of radiation therapy allows radiation oncologists to destroy cancer while sparing healthy tissue. If you have been diagnosed with colorectal cancer, your doctor may also discuss the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. There are a number of clinical trials available in the treatment of colorectal cancer. 
Clinical trials are important in the development of new treatment options to help treat or manage colorectal cancer. In today's episode of the Oncogene Brief, we talk with Dr. Paul Berggren and Dr. Daniel Jondal, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona, and Dr. Sukhdeep Pada from Arizona Gastrointestinal Associates and Arrowhead Gastroenterology Associates in Glendale, Arizona. Dr. Berggren, Dr. Jondal, and Dr. Pada are all involved in the screening, diagnosis, and treatment of colorectal cancer, as well as the prevention of the disease. The series is developed in collaboration with our online journal, Oncozine, at www.oncozine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about colorectal cancer. Let's listen to our interview. I'm here with Dr. Paul Berggren and with Dr. Uh, Dan Jondal, both from Arizona Digestive Health, and Dr. Sukhdeep Pada. He is from Arizona Gastrointestinal Associates. Welcome to the Oncogene Brief. Thank you. Thank you. Before we're going to uh, talk about gastrointestinal cancer, colon cancer, colorectal cancer, and how we can treat that or how it's being treated, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your background. Let me start with uh, you, Dr. Uh, Perkwin. I am a gastroenterologist. I've been in Arizona for 30 years now, originally graduated from LSU Medical School, came out here for training and ended up staying. I'm part of a very large group of gastroenterologists to cover basically the entirety of Maricopa County. I have probably 26 locations, eight ambulatory surgical centers, pathology lab. So we offer the full spectrum of care of the gastrointestinal patient. Dr. Jungle. Uh, yes, so I'm a gastrointestinal pathologist. Um, I did my residency training in Denver, followed up by uh, specialized uh, gastrointestinal pathology training in Cleveland before coming down here to Phoenix. And as the pathologist in the group, I spend my days uh, behind the microscope, staring through the microscope and looking at all the biopsies that my gastroenterologist colleagues take during the procedures. And Dr. Pada. And I'm Dr. Pada. I have been here in Arizona for uh, quite some time as well, since 1994. I came here to do my residency and then my fellowship in GI. And Dr. Bergreen was one of the mentors uh, for me uh, during my fellowship. And I'm here in practice now for for a number of years, since 2000 or so. And uh, we also have a larger group, about uh, 11 providers right now with different offices in the Valley and provide the whole spectrum of... uh, yeah, of, of care. Yeah. yeah. Now, in a previous program uh, that aired earlier in the month, um, we uh, were talking a little bit about diagnostics, about screening. Um, we were talking a little bit about the importance of screening. Uh, we were talking about uh, things like colonoscopy. I mean, um, I remember you, Dr. Berggren, you were explaining why it's not necessarily a bad thing, and, and that's basically people should not fear uh, the procedure, which is actually good because we, first of all, we want to take take away the fear people have for a colonoscopy. In this program, we're going to talk a little bit more about treatment options that are out there. Treatment options in, in, in have a variety of things, there may be surgical options if necessary, if people are diagnosed with cancer. Uh, there may be also treatments in, in chemotherapy or immunotargeted therapy or other therapies that are out there. But first, let's let's start a little bit in summarizing the treatment options. Say that there is a patient, and maybe I, I start with you, Dr. Jondal. It's like that. When you see a slide, when you see the evidence that there is cancer, mm-hmm. what is the next step? Yeah, so uh, my job is relatively straightforward. I, I'm sent biopsies every day from my, my colleagues, and uh, we process those biopsies, and I have a team of people that take those uh, tissue biopsies and put them onto slides and stain them so that I can see what's going on under the microscope. Almost on a daily basis, and in fact, uh, frequently multiple times a day, we diagnose colon cancer and other types of cancer of the gastrointestinal tract. Our job is to make the correct diagnosis, of course, because that's set, uh, you know that sets up the pa- patient for the correct therapy. And uh, we generate a report. So we create a report giving all the details of what we see under the microscope so that our gastroenterologist colleagues can take the next step. And, and, and Dr. Pada, now you're going to get a slide. You get some results that you see from your uh, pathologist. What do you do? A lot of the times... Uh The diagnosis of a cancer is pretty obvious at the time of the colonoscopy to us. And the pathology confirmation, obviously, is essential to get the histological 
type of the cancer, and sometimes we get more clues from the histological type in terms of staining for genetic mutations and stuff like that that are helpful to further enhance the confirmation of the diagnosis and, and management as well. Depending on, on the location of the tumor, different modalities can further be undertaken to try to... The next step would be staging of the cancer, generally. Right. And that requires imaging. So staging, so basically the pathology comes back with his or her report. In this mm-hmm. case, uh, Dr. Jandal, of course, might give you a report um, or one of your coworkers in your clinic. What does that part involve, the staging? Generally, staging uh, involves uh, imaging. And imaging would be cross-sectional imaging of the, of the, uh, of the body uh, to look for any evidence of the cancer having gone outside the walls of the colon. And that's and, not what you want to see, of course. That's not what we want to see. And if there's any evidence of any um, lymphadenopathy in the area regionally close to the tumor or further away in the, in the liver uh, and, and places. Also, in the rectum, you can also uh, do staging with rectal endoscopic ultrasound, which can help to see if the tumor has gone through the walls of the colon or not, and if there's any additional lymph and uh, lymphadenopathy in the area. Let's take a short break. After the break, we're back with our interview with Dr. Paul Berggren, Dr. Daniel Jandal, and Dr. Shukti Pada. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongushim Brief. Each day, researchers make new discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Some days they take small steps. Others, huge discoveries lead to giant leaps forward. This progress, both small steps and giant leaps, happens with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are a fundamental path to progress and the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Clinical trials introduce new hope in addition to the current standard of care by allowing researchers to provide participants access to cutting edge and potentially life-saving treatments. So if you're interested in exploring new treatment options while helping to light the path for other patients, clinical trials may be the best choice for you. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more about clinical trials. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hoffman. And this is the Oncogene Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Oncogene Brief, we talk with Dr. Paul Berggren, Dr. Daniel Jandal, and Dr. Sukhdeep Pada. Let's listen to the interview. But when you talk about outside of the, the, the colon, when you talk about that level of disease, you talk about advanced disease. Uh, yes. Uh, if the tumor has gone, if you see disease in the liver, that would be a stage four cancer. Mm-hmm. And if it's contained within the walls of the colon, uh, depending on, there's Duke staging, there's also the more advanced, uh, the TNM staging of the cancer. So we appropriately stage the cancer, and that determines what kind of treatment the patient will get. Okay. Now, Dr. Berggren, when you see that a cancer may be advanced or maybe not so advanced um, as uh, Dr. Pada refers to, what do you do? What, 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 besides the staging, what are some of the recommendations that you may start looking at? Just for clarity, let me just back up a little bit and in, in, uh, maybe a, just a slightly larger picture. Colonoscopy is where we start with right. in this procedure. And we find polyps sometimes. These, there are several different types of polyps. And the type that we're most interested in is called an adenoma. And that's a benign but precancerous type of polyp. That can be removed endoscopically, typically completely. And that is truly preventing colon cancer in a significant number of patients. Depending on the size of the polyp, the location, the, and the histologic, as in under the microscope characteristics of the polyp, we may see that this is more advanced. And sometimes those lesions can still be removed completely at time of colonoscopy. So that's actually what we're talking about there is curing a very early stage colon cancer with colonoscopy. 
And we do that on a regular basis. But that is very early on. Correct. When we're talking about the more advanced lesions, then we're talking about cancerous cells that have left the polyp and have invaded into the wall of the colon or perhaps through the wall of the colon into lymph nodes that are outside of the colon or more distant into the liver. And that's, of course, what you don't want to see. And so that's when we start talking about more significant treatment options. And that's when we're talking about uh, what Dr. Pato was referencing, which is we have to stage the cancer. We have to find out where it is. And that information, interestingly, what I typically tell my patients that have something bad found at colonoscopy is that this information is going to come out to you in little bits over the course of several encounters. So first off, you have the colonoscopy. There's a, there's a tumor there. I'm concerned that it's a cancer. We'll wait for the pathology to come back. That'll typically take 24 hours because Dr. John and most gastrointestinal pathologists are very efficient at looking at that and communicating that back to the endoscopist. And we immediately call the patients. We say, look, we need to get some blood tests. We need to get some abdominal imaging, typically a CAT scan. And so then we get more information from the pathology report. We get more information from the CAT scan report. And then the patient is typically referred either for endoscopic ultrasound, if that's in the rectum, or perhaps just to a surgeon, whether it's a general surgeon or a colorectal surgeon. And that surgeon is then going to see that patient relatively promptly, get the patient in for surgery, and do the appropriate surgical approach. Sometimes, based on what we've found thus far, that surgeon may say, you know what, before we do surgery, let's send you to a radiation oncologist or a regular medical oncologist and do what's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy or radiation to shrink the tumor down before surgery. So what are the next steps? I would like to start again with you, Dr. Birkin. Well, typically what you're going to be talking about is a surgical approach to remove a segment of the colon and get the patient through that hospitalization. And typically that occurs successfully. What happens after that is that that surgical specimen is sent to the hospital pathologist or the gastrointestinal pathologist. Like Dr. Jundel. Correct. And there's going to be a lot of work done on that specimen to determine how much tumor is there, how much spread through the wall, and if any of the lymph nodes that are sampled during surgery contain tumor. And with those factors all being evaluated, the surgeon and the oncologist can determine if any post-surgical treatment, such as chemotherapy, is necessary or beneficial. Now, let's uh, talk about that uh, with you a little bit, Dr. Pada. A lot of people don't necessarily understand the ter terminology when you talk about neoadjuvant therapy or adjuvant therapy. I mean, it's often used in the literature, uh, but it is not, I think most of our audience today will not necessarily understand uh, the terms that are associated with that. Can you explain a little bit about the difference in the kind of therapies that would uh, be used? It depends also on the location of the tumor, whether uh, neoadjuvant, meaning treatment of with chemo or radiation uh, prior to surgical intervention. So be before you're going to do surgery. Uh, is required or not. And uh, in the rectum, it is very common, depending on the stage of the, the cancer in the rectum, that preoperative uh, radiation uh, and chemotherapy is employed. In other areas of the colon, typically the approach is surgical before chemotherapy is employed later on. And, and when you talk about neoadjuvant, so basically before you go to surgery, I assume that the purpose of that is to shrink the tumor, to make sure that it becomes more responsive to surgery, that it's easier for in surgery. Is that, is that correct? Uh, that is a part of the reason. And also in, in studies for rectal cancer, it has been shown that resectability is improved and post-operative recurrence is reduced by, by giving preoperative chemo radiation. Now, now let, let's look at the, the chemotherapy in, in that's been given. A lot of them, I mean, uh, some companies um, or some patients may complain about some of the side effects of uh, some of the treatment options. Um, I, I, th I think there are some platinum-based chemotherapies that may have some side effects. Dr. Berkwin, tell me a little bit about that. Well, the side effects that people typically are familiar with with that type of a problem is going to be nausea and vomiting, stomach pain, weight loss, uh, potentially hair loss. And 
those are side effects that can be managed in the vast majority of patients. Some regimens are actually significantly better tolerated and don't have all the side effects that you might have heard of 15, 20 years ago. And so the decision to use chemotherapy is going to be made with the patient and the oncologist using data to say, look, this is the stage of cancer that you've got, and this is your, what we call maybe a three or five year survival percentage. And this is how much it can be improved by a course of chemotherapy. And so that's, uh, it's not an easy decision sometimes, but sometimes it's fairly clear that if patients want to get all the benefit of therapy for their tumor, that that's the direction to proceed in. I would also add a lot of the times surgery is curative for colon cancer if caught early, as long as it's contained within the walls of the colon. And sometimes a significantly sized tumor may be well contained within the walls of the colon. And surgery is all the patient needs. And if you look at five-year survivals in those patients who are caught early, it is 90%. That's definitely good news, I would say. Now, when you look at um, a little bit more general, um, and you, you look at chemotherapy, um, you mentioned some of, uh, Dr. Bergwin, you mentioned some of the, the side effects that people are familiar with. Over the last uh, 5, 10, 15 years, a different way of uh, therapy came on the market, I mean, came available to patients like targeted therapies, uh, also like immuno-oncology therapy, therapeutic approaches in there, which are really focusing on the cancer, really trying to kill the cancer before it kills health tissue. What about those kind of therapies? Those are certainly available. If your oncologist is going to recommend that you use an advanced treatment regimen, then they're going to have good information based on the pathology specimen your medical risks, et cetera, as to why that's going to be more beneficial than a standard chemotherapy regimen. But quite frankly, especially in a metropolitan area like Phoenix, you have access to some of the most advanced oncology centers available. And so with those resources available, there's no reason not to explore any option that makes sense. You mentioned about the availability of resources. Of course, I mean, the fact that we are sitting here with uh, people from two different uh, organizations speaks volumes. Somebody told me just recently that uh, Arizona is really unique. Uh, Phoenix, the Phoenix metro area, is really unique in in a sense that the amount of available physicians and, and hospital beds and, and ability to provide treatment to patients is the largest on the west side of Houston, more so than in California and more so than in, in, in more to the north. How does that impact the number of patients that you see? Does it have an effect? In general... For gastroenterology, I think it's a pretty busy field, uh, and um, screening colonoscopies is a large part of the gastrointestinal practice. On the average, uh, most gastroenterologists do a lot of screening screening colonoscopies uh, on, on, a, on a regular basis. So there are a lot of GI doctors in Phoenix, but everybody is quite busy, and despite all the resources we have over here, I think there's always a concern for people not getting the care that they, they need because, you know, we know that from data that only about two-thirds of the people who actually require screening colonoscopies done are getting it done. And there's still a third of population, about three-quarters of a million in Arizona, who require screening colonoscopies that have not been done. That's exactly right. The, interestingly, the, the national numbers are about 65, 66% of people have been screened appropriately in Arizona. That's 62%. So we're lagging a little bit behind the national average. The American Cancer Society is estimating right now there's going to be 2,840 new cases of colon cancer in Arizona this year and uh, over 1,000 deaths, 1,050 deaths from colon cancer. We do have significant healthcare resources in this valley, but we are also as a county growing at an amazing clip. I think that we were the first or second fastest growing county in the country for the last couple of years. So there's lots of resources, but there's lots of people. Let's take a short break, and then we talk some more with Dr. Paul Bergreen, Dr. Daniel Jondal, and Dr. Sukhdi Pada. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. 
Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongazine Brief. If you're just joining us, in the Ongazine Brief today, we talk with Dr. Paul Burgreen, Dr. Daniel Jandel, and Dr. Sukti Pada, who are all involved in the diagnosis and treatment of colorectal cancer. Now, if you um, look again about access, because that's another part of what we were talking about in an earlier program, how do you see people have access. I mean, you're, 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 we were talking about insurance. We talk about other kind of ways to... Uh, what are the, the, the things that you notice in that area? So a lot of uh, GI practices have uh, an approach of open access colonoscopy as well, where patients can directly approach uh, the practice for, uh, for screening colonoscopies. Most of the act- patients that are referred to us come through primary care practices. So, And uh, that is where the, the gatekeeper role is. And it's important for the primary care pract- uh, practitioners to appropriately screen people at the appropriate age. And uh, remember, screening is in people who are asymptomatic, and that's the recommendations that uh, that that need to be followed. And uh, at an you know, appropriate age for the patient, this needs to be discussed with the patient, and uh, the patient should then be referred to experts for for the management. If you um, now look at uh, because I think you mentioned asymptomatic. People, you have patients that are really are, may not have any symptoms. They may be found to colonoscopy or other ways. But if a patient goes to their GP, their general physician, what are some of the things that even before you go to colonoscopy, which may be the standard, what they should be aware of? I mean, and, and, and the reason I'm asking, if you look at the analogy, for example, of ovarian cancer, a lot of women are not getting the treatment that they need to get or not early enough the treatment they need to get uh, because they ascribe the symptoms they may have to their monthly cycle or other occurrences in which they simply kind of not think about cancer. How does that relate or how does that translate to, for example, colon cancer or similar kind of cancers? Yeah, so I think it really emphasizes the importance of that screening age of what is currently 50, which may be bumped down to 45 for everyone to get screened. And I have a a really uh, useful story to tell your audience of a patient that I uh, saw a couple years ago. A big polyp came in from one of my gastroenterologist partners. The patient was 52, actually, no, excuse me, 51 years of age. And he had chosen to skip his screening at age 50 because he just didn't he didn't think it was necessary. He didn't really want to go through what he thought might be an uncomfortable procedure. Uh, and in the previous show, we kind of uh, explained that it's it's uh, the procedure is not as uncomfortable as it used to be. It's actually very comfortable and not very inconvenient. And this patient had a big polyp, and the polyp had cancer. So it had gone, it had progressed from the precancerous polyp to an actually cancerous polyp. And fortunately for him, it hadn't gone deep into the bowel wall. And had he been screened at age 50, very good chance that that polyp would have just been precancerous and not cancerous. Had he waited another year, pretty good chance that cancer would have gone in deeper into the wall and potentially been a very big cancer that he might not have survived from. So I I think it's hard to overstress the importance for patients to realize, you know, once you hit the screening age for any screening test, whether it's for colon cancer or for cervical cancer or for ovarian cancer or for breast cancer, and, you know, all of these um, different organ systems have cancers of their own. And, and we set up screening in the United States specifically to save lives. And even though there's a lot of hesitation among patients to go through the hassle and uh, potential, you know, minor discomfort of some of the screening procedures, it's it's really important to remember. Uh, and I hope the story I told just kind of helps uh, hit home to to your audience. You know that that these these screening tests do save lives, and I, I see it on a daily basis. I diagnose adenomatous polyps, which are precancerous polyps. I diagnose probably. I don't know, 40 or 50 a day. You know, all those patients that got screened, those those precancerous polyps were removed and they don't have to worry 
about getting colon cancer if they keep following the, the screening guidelines. And I'll, I'll add one thing, that, and I tell my patients this, because they ask me what's the most common symptom of colon cancer, and I tell them the most common symptom of colon cancer is no symptom, because it's early, and you've got it, and we don't know about it. And they say, well, I feel fine. Why should I get screened? And I say, when you've got symptoms, you've got a problem. Now, rectal bleeding, second most common symptom, right? And so when we see people with rectal bleeding, whether it's visible or whether it's just found on a fit test, that's an automatic indication for an evaluation of the colon. But people need to know not to wait for symptoms. That is not a good strategy. Yeah, I, I would echo that very strongly as well, that uh, screening should be done at uh, in asymptomatic uh, patients, and obviously when symptoms occur, whether it's a change of bowel habits, whether it's rectal bleeding, whether it's obstructive symptoms, whether it's iron deficiency anemia, sometimes things can be a little bit late, and uh, there are more chances of finding something more significant when you're symptomatic. And asymptomatic, again, the choice of the test is also very important, I would say, that the correct discussion should be had with the patient by somebody who understands the nature of all the screening modalities, whether it's a FIT test, whether it's a screening colonoscopy, whether it's a ColoGuard multi-targeted DNA test, as to why we are choosing the test, whether the patient would make a different choice just because colonoscopy has not been properly discussed with the patient. Colonoscopy is the best test out there for screening and should be the preferred method. So again, um it, when, when it comes to, to diagnosing cancer, when it comes to the patient itself or the individual that is not a patient yet, let me start with that. Don't wait till there are symptoms. Abide by the rules in terms of getting colonoscopy or if you choose to do so another test, as long as something is being done as early as possible, but then basically at age 50. And my understanding here, sitting with uh, three physicians, you all three uh, prefer to have people do a colonoscopy rather than anything else. Without and a doubt. Colonoscopy is unique because there are alternatives, not as good, but there are alternatives. But colonoscopy is a unique screening test in medicine because it screens for, diagnoses, prevents, and treats cancer or precancerous lesions with one test. No other test in medicine does that. I think there is information out there about colonoscopy being being the ideal test as long as you're uh, healthy enough to get it done and, and there's no other contraindications to get it done. I, I think it's important that the patient should understand the characteristics of these tests. If somebody comes to me and discusses why this, why not this, I can discuss the characteristics of these tests and, and easily convince people to proceed in the right direction, which in my mind is a colonoscopy. But at least it's important that screening should be done in everybody. I think any which way if patients are getting screened, that's a good thing. Uh, certain other tests, uh, and again, as, I think it's important that these should be discussed with the patient. The characteristics of the test should be discussed with the patient. And if somebody doesn't know everything about how the patient should be screened, it's probably better to have a referral to an expert so that we can discuss the test with them. One of the things I mentioned in the previous uh, segment, and I think it's worth uh, reiterating for, pa for people who didn't uh, hear it, is Dr. Bergerian and I were talking about uh, friends that we know that are physicians and, uh, you know, do we know any physician that would do anything but a colonoscopy? And both of us agreed, uh, you know, we don't know a single physician that would do anything but a colonoscopy. And I'd certainly like to hear what Dr. Pata has to say about that. I, I would concur on that. I think there is uh, all physicians, all, uh, you know, even including um, people we, we work with, they come and get their screening colonoscopies done. And uh, sometimes it is a little disappointing to us that when we know that the patient should have had a colonoscopy, comes back with a positive fecal occult test or a positive uh, test. And when you discuss with the patient that why did you do this in particular, why was this test done in particular, the answer is not very satisfactory. Uh, I think uh, that that tells me that that patient in the first place could have been uh, screened uh, for, for a colonoscopy. So that's uh, the benefit of being uh, in a, a building in downtown Phoenix uh, is the fact that we have some company at times flying over, but that's, uh, that's okay. Let's take a short break. After the break, we're back with more information about colorectal cancer screening, diagnosis, treatment, and what you can do to cope if you have been diagnosed with the disease. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief.
Each day, researchers make new discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Some days they take small steps. Others, huge discoveries lead to giant leaps forward. This progress, both small steps and giant leaps, happens with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are a fundamental path to progress and the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Clinical trials introduce new hope in addition to the current standard of care by allowing researchers to provide participants access to cutting edge and potentially life-saving treatments. So if you're interested in exploring new treatment options while helping to light the path for other patients, clinical trials may be the best choice for you. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more about clinical trials. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Oncazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hoffland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. Our interview today with Dr. Paul Bergreen and Dr. Daniel Jondal, both from Arizona Digestive Health in Phoenix, Arizona, and Dr. Sukhdeep Pada from Arizona Gastrointestinal Associates and Arrowhead Gastroenterology Associates in Glendale, Arizona, was originally recorded on Wednesday, February 27th, 2019, in Phoenix, Arizona. As I've said in the beginning of uh, like the introduction of the show, uh, in February 2000, the National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month uh, was uh, inaugurated by uh, then-President Clinton to dedicate this month, March, as, um, as, as a way to look at colorectal cancer in its widest scope. Dr. Bergrain, why is this an important month to, to look at that? And, and what are you telling your patients or what should patients be aware of, of know or understand uh, about what they can do maybe this month or what this month is specifically for? for? You know, it's a, it's a nice month to make sure that people are, are paying attention to this particular issue. I mean, from, from our standpoint, every month is Colon Cancer Prevention Month, but we, we take this opportunity to say, look, you know, you're a, a 40-year-old uh, person who's here for reflux, but your parents are still alive and they're in their 70s. Have they been screened? Do you have anybody who's 50 who has any questions about colonoscopy? Do you need a resource? We have, as is Dr. Pata, we have an extensive website with a library of documents and videos regarding this and regarding colon cancer screening and prevention. And it, this is a great opportunity to take advantage of those resources. We actually also use this opportunity to reach some of the general population on some of the local radio stations just to see if we can make sure that people are at least have this in the front of their minds. Say, oh, yeah, it's about time for my colonoscopy. I forgot to do it last year, but I'm going to get it done now. I think it's worth reminding your listeners uh, that every year 150,000 people are diagnosed with colon cancer just in the United States, 150,000. And that number might seem small to some people when you think about how many people are in the United States, but it seems tremendous to those of us, uh, to, to physicians, because it's an um, almost entirely preventable cancer. It's one of the rare cancers that we could almost prevent almost 100% if people would get screened when they're supposed to. And so it's really unique in that way um, that we screen for all kinds of cancers, uh, but colon cancer screening is one of the most successful uh, uh, screening programs. There has been a significant decline in the incidence of colon cancer over the past decades, but still colon cancer happens to be the second largest cancer killer after the age of 50. And uh, it, is, uh, it is quite significant, and this is an opportunity for us to remind our patients, which we do on a regular basis, but this month also gives us an opportunity to outreach uh, through radio shows or through other community events. Uh, there's a colon model out there in which you can walk through the colon model and see what these lesions look like. And uh, so these, this gives patients the opportunity to um, view what can be found during a colonoscopy. And it's good to have experts at hand at that time to be, to be helpful for the patients. 
So all in all, a very important month, uh, not only to emphasize the importance of treatment and screening, uh, but basically reach people with a message, get screened and look at what can be done. This is preventable. You don't have to die for colon cancer. Don't be stupid, as I would say. And you get to tell them after a negative colonoscopy that, hey, you know what? You're good for 10 years. See you, uh, see you in a decade. Well, th that's also good. And in this case, it is also very good to realize that negative is actually positive. Exactly. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. A cancer diagnosis can be emotionally challenging. And while most patients learn to cope with their disease in their own unique way, here are some additional suggestions that may help. First of all, know what to expect is an important step in coping. If you have been diagnosed with cancer, Try to learn as much about your cancer as possible to help you feel comfortable when making treatment decisions. Ask your doctor to tell you the type and stage of your cancer, as well as your treatment options and their side effects. Keep in mind, the more you know, the more confident you'll be when it comes to making decisions about your own care. It is also important to keep friends and family close. Research has shown that keeping your close relationships strong will definitely help you deal with your cancer and cancer treatment. Your friends and family can provide the practical support you'll need and they can serve as emotional support when you feel down, depressed or overwhelmed by the disease. Finally, it is important to find someone to talk with. Find a good listener who is willing to listen to you talk about your hopes and fears. This may be a close friend or a trusted family member. But the concern and understanding of a counselor, medical social worker, or cancer support group may also be helpful. If you don't know where to find local support groups in your area, ask your doctor about it. There is also a lot of trusted information you can find online. The website of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention focuses on screening tests for men and women aged 50 years and older. This website includes fact sheets with the basic information about colorectal cancer. Another resource is the website from the National Cancer Institute, which provides information about colorectal cancer for patients and health professionals. And if you want to learn more about personalized medicine and targeted therapies in cancer, including colorectal cancer, visit the website of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, which includes doctor-approved patient information. Another resource is the website from the American Cancer Society. This website offers a wealth of information about cancer including risk factors, symptoms, how a particular cancer is found, and how it is being treated. For us here at the Youngers in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners and underwriters, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. You can also download our program via iTunes. In Arizona, you can listen to the Youngers in Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that, check our online journal, oncozine.com, at www.oncozine.com. To help make this program possible, we need your help. If you want to support this program, know that your support for this program allows us to bring your interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new cancer treatments. For more information on how to support the Oncozine Brief, go to our website at oncozine.com or visit our page at patreon.com forward slash the Oncozine Brief. Finally, if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866 and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all and thank you for listening and join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland and this is the Youngest in Brief. The Oncozine Brief was produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncozine Brief comes from listeners of this station 
and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949-923-1660 or visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.